Welcome uh, to Discussions with the Writer Fred right here at Black Video News on a very hot summer day in good old San Antonio, Texas. <laughs> Today, we're going to have a discussion about a subject that I feel very dear to my heart because I played a major role, well, half a major role in it becoming a reality. And that is the importance of a man that's pretty much unknown to a lot of the population, uh, Bayard Rustin, and the importance he played in the entire civil rights movement going all the way back to 1956 when he first met Dr. Martin Luther King, right up to Dr. King's death in 1968. The two gentlemen here with me today are Sterling Zinsmeyer and <laughs> Lane Denton. And let me just tell you a little about my guests before we get into the discussion. Sterling was in theatrical and television productions, which was interrupted by the AIDS epidemic. He is one of the two living members of the original Buddy team formed in 1983 at Gay Men's Health Crisis. He established the first full service HIV AIDS residence in the Bronx and Harlem has a long history of LGBT political activism, serving two terms as president of the New York City Stonewall Democrats. And you all know we just had the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall uh, Rebellion that took place in 1969. He is also executive director, producer of the award-winning mm -hmm. film Latter Day and the acclaimed chamber opera Fellow Travelers. He currently serves as the executive director of the Center for Contemporary Arts in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Sterling, welcome to Thank Discussions you. with the writer Fred. Thank you, Fred. We also have someone who's been with us before. That's right. <laughs> Mr. Lane Denton. Looking forward to it, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> and he served um, in the state Texas legislature from 1971 to 1977 and was chair of the State House Committee on Social Services and chair of the Subcommittee on Public Welfare. And in that role, he exposed the abusive treatment of young black girls that were brought here uh, as was like... From Chicago. Yeah, Chicago. Mm -hmm. Detention Center. Detention Very center. similar to what's happening in South Texas. and Right, today. absolutely, yeah. And the cages that they, they kept use. the girls in. Right and they slept on concrete floors. Yeah. It was a major scandal. NBC News covered it. It was mentioned, uh, Reader's Digest. Right. Uh, we were in Time Magazine. And was, you brought that to, you exposed it initially, yes. right? And brought it to an end. The Attorney General, John Hill, put a stop to it. Right. And the girls went back to Chicago. Um, and there were also some from Louisiana, but it was a but national scandal. Most important, you closed that down. Oh yes, So that didn't absolutely. happen anymore. Okay. Speaking of books, and we're going to be talking about a book, there was an, an excellent book written about that whole episode, which is why important getting books published on significant issues is so important. And we have one here we're yes, going to discuss today. today. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Lane was also, as a freshman legislator in 1971, was the leader of a group called the Dirty 30. <laughs> <laughs> And they got that name because they were doing good stuff. Well, and there was only 30 of us. And, and you changed and the whole kind of function of how that state legislature, by removing the Speaker of the House, I believe, in 1973, he was defeated, right? Well, he was eventually before 73, but we elected a new Speaker, uh, Price Daniel Jr., and passed eight reform legislation that is most of them, well, all of them are still in effect today and are considered the most comprehensive reform legislation in the history of any state legislature. Yeah. And I authored the Open Records Law. Right. If any of you out there have heard of the Sharpstown scandal, uh, Lane was instrumental in exposing that and getting a few of the people um, convicted, right? Correct. Yeah. Also, Lane worked for Senator Ted Kennedy uh, in 1980 in his, in his uh, campaign. Lane is right now writing his memoirs that we hope to have finished and out by next summer. Time for the 20, 
2020 <laughs> Which will give us campaign. another book, too. Give uh, us another book. Right. Yeah. But okay. I, I, the whole point is on all these historical points, and it's one of the most significant in why Sterling, when he came and brought at a coffee session and said, this is the type of book, an individual, that needs story that needs to be told. Right. And that's what it's all about, and that's how we got started, Fred, yeah. if you remember. Right, and that brings us to why we are here today. Sterling and Lane met with me, oh my God, that was three years ago now. It was. It was, it was 2016, and Sterling wanted to bring to light the importance of uh, Bayard Rustin and what he had done in the Civil Rights Movement. I had had the opportunity way back in the early 70s when I was teaching at Monterey Peninsula College and he came down there as part of the um, A. Philip Randolph Institute and I introduced him. And I can remember all the time we were sitting up there at the podium he kept complaining that his feet were hurting. So, <laughs> and it just seems then what, almost 50 years later, I get the opportunity to work with these two gentlemen to write the importance of, uh, to, of uh, Bay Bayard to the whole civil rights movement. Well, I jumped at it when Sterling said, this is an untold story, an individual that really was never in prominent position in American history, right. particularly the civil rights movement. And I introduced Fred who is probably the premier writer in San Antonio and the author of, what, a half dozen books. Mm -hmm. And the latest one is this yeah. one. Well, I mean, yeah. I, you know, I, I, um, I was a history and political science major at UT and studied with J. Frank Doby and Walter Prescott Webb and have okay. a real appreciation for history. And we stand mm -hmm. on the shoulders of giants. And, yes. And when I got to New York very early, I was very young, um, I um, heard about Bayard Rustin and that read, a, um, read a, a very academic book about him. Mm -hmm. um, and there were still people around who remembered him in those days. Right. Um, yeah. When we were doing the project in Harlem, I, had, I worked with an activist Episcopal priest named Bob Castle, who got thrown out of the diocese in Newark for supporting the um, um, uh, radical African Americans who were there. Um, Anyway, he sponsored this residence, and this was mm -hmm. back in 83, 84. But I became really interested in the heroes, particularly heroes in the black community who also happened to be gay. And right. Bayard Rustin was openly gay. He, he uh, suffered the consequences of some of that. But he was an amazing strategist for the civil rights movement. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, he was a genius. And he was a genius behind the civil rights movement. I'm, right. I'm convinced. Right, and I just felt we needed to do a book that would tell his story in a more novel form that more people would read, particularly young people, mm -hmm. because they're, we need, particularly in this time, we need heroes. And yes. he, was a great, he was a great inspiration for me and, uh, and many others. Yeah. And I think one of the things we do with the book is this, this, this discussion about is the gay movement a civil rights movement? And we know we have a lot of folks that say, no, uh, gays have a choice. We had to be black. They don't have to be gay. Well, uh, and then the question comes up, well, what would Dr. King say? I think we answer it in this book. I think we answer it right in the pages of this book right. that Dr. King would have s agreed that the gay movement is a civil rights movement. And, and one of the other things, this, this whole idea about, well, you don't have a choice. Bayard would, would tell you he was gay. He was gay, there was no question about it. And, and, uh, and it wasn't a choice for him, it was his lifestyle. He accepted it and he lived it. And what he did then is he took his genius and he applied it to the civil rights movement knowing that he was gonna get a lot of opposition from black ministers, mm -hmm. which indeed he did. And you, we covered in this book. And I guess A. Philip Randolph, who was the guiding force behind Go to Montgomery, uh, Bayard, they have to have you, you or right. he. And A. Philip Randolph was a brilliant and outstanding uh, organizer. And like a father to Bayard. He, he yeah. was, and when he said, you have to go, and I'm sure uh, A. Philip Randolph paid the way for Bayard to go to Montgomery and arrives in Montgomery, and it was a chaotic situation. 
it, it did not look good when he arrived. Uh, the Birmingham uh, police dogs had been attacking. Yeah. Martin Luther King's house had been burned. It had just been uh, bombed when he got there. Yeah. Murders had uh, already it was occurred. Montgomery. In Mon Montgomery. Montgomery, but yes. the episode in Birmingham yeah. with the... Was, yeah, it was later. With the dogs, yeah. right. Oh, when, when he got... What, what happened is a lady by the name of Lillian Smith saw what was happening and told Dr. King... Blacks were, were responding violently when the, sure. when the movement first started. And Lillian Smith said, you can't win that battle. And you're going to have to take a different approach. And she told Dr. King, you need to get Bayard Rustin down here so he can help you with a nonviolent approach uh, to defeating segregation. Right. So Bayard goes down there. He arrives at King's house, goes inside. First thing he sees is a gun. Mm -hmm. Laying, laying on, on, on a chair. And so he tells Dr. King, you gotta get rid of that gun. Well, Dr. King says, well, my house has just been bombed. I need a gun to protect my family. He said, no, 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 no. For you, nonviolence has to be a, a philosophy and it takes a lot of self-discipline. I don't care what they do, you cannot respond violently. And that started to change Dr. King's whole approach to the nonviolent. Right. So for his followers, uh, Bayard said, it could be a tactic, just a one-time thing you use. But for you as a leader, it has to be a philosophy. And Dr. King adopted it as a philosophy. And, and we touch on that, that scene, I think, right. very good in this book right. where he walks in the home and sees that, that gun. Right. Well, right. Let me go back to you, Sterling, yeah. for a second. What was the driving force for you to do this? What, to do well, the book? Yeah, to do the book. Well, because I think particularly young people need to know about this gentleman. I also think that there's, um, there's homophobia everywhere, but I think in the black community, having worked in that community in Harlem, uh, particularly in the churches, there's a lot of homophobia there. And, you know, the march towards freedom, it's not a contest whether this is, whether gay rights or civil rights or not. Uh, Julian Bond said it best. I mean, he, he saw no problem at all with it. Uh, we're all marching in the same direction. We need to support each other. And there's a lot of historic homophobia that Bayard uh, had to live with yes, um, yeah. and many other great black leaders. Um, so I just wanted to get the story out. I was terrific to find you. And Thank I mean, you. the three of us have long history in activism. So I, I really am thrilled that you took this up mm -hmm. and and we've got this thing out and people can find out more about Bayard. Yeah, yeah I, I'm wondering, when you talk about the homophobia in the black community, I, I mean, that's new to me because it was never a problem when I grew up with my friends, with my family. We, we gave it no consideration. So I'm wondering, and I don't know if you want to touch on this, is it more the ministers or the population? I think it's a, sure. it's a combination of, of the culture, it's ignorance, it's, uh, you know, when I left college, <clears throat> I went to Kenya for two years. There was very little homophobia in East Africa. Um, really? Yeah. Very little. It was not, not anything anybody talked about. Then the Christian ministers invaded Uganda and Kenya, and they got these lo additional laws passed. There were some laws left over from England but nobody paid any attention to them. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, it's, it's a huge, there are 63 countries in the world that homosexuality is still punishable by death. Many of them in That's Africa. incredible, isn't it? It is. It's, <laughs> um, incredible. So it's ignorance. Uh, there's homophobia everywhere. I mean, certainly I experienced it enough growing up in Texas. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not gonna put it just on the ministers, but they perpetuate that um, or have. I was, uh, I witnessed during the AIDS epidemic uh, we went to several churches trying to get their support. They were in complete denial about the AIDS epidemic, even though many, several members of their choir would be suffering, you could tell. Mm -hmm. It took 10 years before the Black Caucus ever passed a bill to do anything about AIDS. And I was fortunate I was invited to the signing of that bill for my work in Harlem. But mm -hmm. it, they really drug their feet. If we had been able to get more of more consciousness in that community. Today, the rate of HIV is much higher among African Americans than any other population because in, in they the United States. Because they won't... Uh, uh, they won't get the word out. It's like the alcoholic has to 
admit he's an alcoholic before he can get help. So the, the, the folks that are homophobic have to admit they are that way in, in order to get beyond it and we could start to deal. That's a serious problem. Well, well and also, uh, let's talk about AIDS was mentioned in 1983 but it was, what, 86 before the President of the United States Reagan. would Absolutely. use the word. So well, it wasn't just right. black men. Oh, no, and it was also in New York City. I chaired the first study about AIDS among minority groups, and we documented in 84 that it was going into these populations, Hispanic and African American. Mm -hmm. And the, the state government itself shelved that study for five years. Mm -hmm. Nobody wanted to look at that. Um, so homophobia is still ra rampant, just like racism is still rampant, and all of us have to work through that process ourselves. And, and hopefully our book will here help. will help. Well, yeah. so. some the, new young yeah. activists will come out of learning how to do civil disobedience and the nonviolence. Yeah. This is the, the message. Right. Yeah. Book is Bayard Martin, a historical novel about friendship and the civil rights movement. And when we come back, we're gonna discuss how you can get this book and how we plan to proceed to Marie, make it an international bestseller. Diabetes. We'll I be right back. I don't have time to eat right or exercise. I'm a busy mom. Oh, you're a busy mom. Yeah. This is great news. Busy moms never get prediabetes. Wait, what? Let me just... Yeah, this is all the people at risk for prediabetes and way over here, busy moms. No? 40% of food in America is never eaten. One in six seniors faces the threat of hunger, and millions more live in isolation. America, let's do lunch. Drop off a hot meal and say a quick hello. Volunteer for Meals on Wheels by donating your lunch break at americaletsdolunch.org. Do you want to retire like a champ? Just like legendary basketball star Uncle Drew? Don't do it like that, Uncle Drew! You're already acing the game. You've got your dream ride. Don't be slamming my door. Sorry about that. You just did the nah. same. Gotta get the boys. Your dream vacation and your dream team. And now you can make your retirement just as legendary. I get buckets. Get the tips you need to get on track at aceyourretirement.org. Observe the domesticated human family in their natural habitat, known to their species as the backyard. Oh, you think I should light it now? I think it's good. Yeah. yeah. Oh dear, someone is about to burn a pile of debris that's too tall, which can start a wildfire. Wait, could it be? Blimey, oh, it is. It's smoky. It's Smoky Bear. What a legend. It's What's the hey, it's Smoky. Here? Sorry, it was too high. Right. Watch as he astutely ensures that there's no wind and how he removes some of the debris to create a smaller, safer burning pile. Well, you see, to make it no, you can't make it bigger, baby. The bigger, the better. Take note right. of our fearless okay. furry friend here, yeah. humans. I appreciate it. Chris Bump. <laughs> Watching you. Smokey's done it again. Bye, Smokey. Only you can prevent wildfires. I'm Tony Hendricks, Chief Operating Officer at Lewis Funeral Home. Lewis Funeral Home has been serving San Antonio and surrounding areas for over 100 years. Lewis Funeral Home's ultimate goal is to help those families in their time of need. If your family is ever in need, please feel free to call us at Lewis Funeral Home, 210-227-7281, or check us out on our website at lewisfuneralhome.com.
nothing to do this week? Don't miss another event. Go to blacksinsanantonio.com for our event calendar. The home of the largest business directory in San Antonio with an African-American focus. Sign up today for our weekly e-blasts and text message alerts. Help us make this a better community. Connect. Empower. Grow. Welcome back to Discussions with the Writer Fred right here in San Antonio. And as I said earlier, in good old hot San Antonio. And today we're discussing a very, very important topic. And that is the life of Bayard Rustin and how he has been cheated out of his place in history because of the stupid homophobia that exists in this in this country. You know, I guess people just have to have someone they can dislike uh, for no reason. They just have to have someone they can dislike. For years, it was black people. It still is black people. Don't learn. Don't misread me. It still is black people. But it's like. The gay community is taking over for the black pe people. Uh, they are, as um, uh, someone said a long time ago when they talked about the young students, they said, you are the new N-word. So the gay community is the new N-word because they're receiving the same kind of treatment that blacks did 50 years ago. I guess we have, we have been raised a notch or two, but it's all stupid. I'll say it right now, it's stupid. And, and so I, I was really, really pleased to be able to participate in the writing of this novel. Again, it's Bayard and Martin, historical novel about friendship and the civil rights movement in this country. And so we're gonna continue our discussion here. And I, I, I think, Sterling, you, alluded to the apathy that, that's going on and well, I mean I think there's that a, can... I think there's apathy uh, every I think we're we're inundated in this political climate that it is so easy to um, to give up to not to not take a stand there's uh, for a lot of people not everyone but there's a lot of people that are very prosperous <laughs> they don't feel what things need to be the apple cart needs to be upset I mean, I will say this about a majority of, of white gay people. They, you know, they had some privileges economically. That as a group, they're yes. in pretty good shape. Absolutely. Uh, but you know, they um, when Let they me come. Let me just say this quickly. That's the advantage they had over us. Yes. <laughs> that is that is the advantage. Yeah. And um, and there's some racism in the gay community. There's no question about it. I think all of us who grew up in this country. I think it's in our DNA. We have to work through it, sometimes a day at a time, sometimes a moment at a time. It's mm -hmm. not something that just goes away because you vote the right way. Mm -hmm. um, so that has to constantly be fought. But I also think in the political arena, we've got, well, the gay community in the mayoral election here got knocked on doors and organized 350, uh, I think it was 3,500 members of the gay community went out and hit the streets for the, for the mayor elect. Mm -hmm. um, that's the kind of activism that needs to be done every election, otherwise we're going to lose. But Sterling, don't you think that's what Bayard Ruskin, the model and example, is all about? Exactly. It, to really get out there? I mean, we haven't talked about it, but go all the way back to 1941. Bayard Ruskin with A. Philip Randolph went to right. FDR yeah. and said, we need to integrate the defense industries. Uh, and he said next. yes. And then later, he went with A. Philip Randolph about desegregating the military. Right. Absolutely. So this is an incredible person yeah. that is, and the story of his involvement in the civil rights is unbelievable. And it should be required reading for every high school and college student in the United States. Yeah. And in fact, the, his hometown, Westchester, Pennsylvania, yeah. named their high school after, after him, him. And they require a study about his life every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that's when we first start talking talk about how extensive his life is. We first start talking about doing this project, and I really dug into the research. The research yeah. No way. <laughs> this oh. could be now would have been a thousand pages. Right. Easily right. a thousand pages. So we came up with a, I think a very unique and novel idea: his relationship with King. 
So that narrowed down uh, right. the scope, and that tied right in because he was he was involved in war resistor movement, the anti nuclear movement, all these movements. So we concentrated on the civil rights uh, movement. Right. He was selected yeah. as one of the 100 most influential uh, Americans in the in the United States he went, of the oh, 20th really? century. Yeah. So Finally. he he's going to go down in history. He, he received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, from, from Obama. President Obama. Yeah. Uh, this is just starting. I think our book uh, is really just opening the door of an incredible career and people are going to say it doesn't really matter that he was gay, American. He's a unbelievable, smart, articulate individual and we haven't talked about him but we would not have today the I Have a Dream speech if it hadn't been for Absolutely. Bayard Rusk. Because he organized uh, the march. Well, I also think he was very human, and I think sometimes we take our, you know, like James Baldwin, uh, we sanitize their personal life, and that's the, a puritanical s streak in this country, and it and it robs them of their humanity. Yes. You know, we did the right. same thing with with uh, Matthew Shepard. Matthew Shepard was a young college kid doing whatever it took to survive. He mm. wasn't a saint. He was a kid who had no money. And he got involved right. in some characters, you know. But we want to sanitize these people, and then that dehumanizes and puts them on a pedestal. Mar uh, Bayard was very much very real. He suffered uh, from some discrimination because of probably an FBI sting um, him, that yeah. publicized his his sexuality. And I think he spent a day in jail and two yeah, spent more than a month jail. month right. Yeah. Well, so, two years uh, in the other later is yeah. a. Right. Draft, uh, World well, War II, peace right? resistance, yeah. right? Yeah. So, Quaker. but I, I think I, I like heroes who are human. I think it's important that, that we can identify human. with that. And I think individuals identify with that. Yeah. And it's interesting because you know, our founding fathers had lots of flaws. Tell me about Martin it. Martin Luther King had lots of flaws, but look what yeah. these men did. Yeah. That's the thing we have to keep remembering. Mm. I'm not forgiving their, you know, mm. what they did. I'm just saying. Mm. Uh, we have to keep our eye on the ball here. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not a strong admirer of the founding fathers, and I think you can understand why I wouldn't. <laughs> no, no, I understand. I was three-fifths right. a person. Sure. My ancestors were three-fifths a person. Yep. They oh. did come up with a tremendous uh, idea. idea for a government, but they never lived up to it. Well, themselves. I think that's the challenge today. We have to live up to it. And right. that's all yeah. of our challenge. Well, that's yeah. what uh, Martin Luther King reminded in the I Have a Dream speech that all men are created equal. And he, he wanted to really emphasize incredible right. time. So where, where, where do we go with this, fellow writers? What, what's, what's our, what's our, how do we do this? How, get how the book we, out? Yes. Well, I think we talk. I think we hold forums. I think we need to... Uh, this is a first step for us to have some publicity about this book. I think it's a book that uh, the gay community certainly needs to read. Um, and I think the African American community, particularly the young folks, need to read it. Sterling, you've been in uh, movie and production. Uh, do you think it has the possibilities of a miniseries on television? Well, I think this, I, I think it either, I actually think this is a film. I think if we focus particularly on there's been there was one documentary PBS did about Bayard Rustin. Right, I yeah. don't think it was particularly good, not mm -hmm. terrible, mm -hmm. but it was the same old traditional thing. Right. Um, <laughs> this is an exciting life. He he led a very exciting life, and like you said, he went all over the world. Um, Absolutely. And he made there's no question it's his influence on Dr. King, and. Yeah. And the movement. So I think we could do a hell of a film about it. We need to get moving on it. Just how did he yeah. do the March on Washington? When A. Philip Randolph put him as his deputy, that was to make sure the march would take place. But how did he do it with no money? No, no cell, cell phones. I mean, no, no cell, cell phones. phones. Oh, <laughs> gee, yeah. I'm, I'm still yeah. amazed. Yeah. And yeah. had what? 250, 300,000 people. Absolutely. Uh, and, and there was a young man we need to mention, um, Rachel. Horowitz and also Thomas Kahn. Thomas was a brilliant, brilliant uh, young man that um, 
Bayard kind of took in mm -hmm. and trained him, and he was very instrumental in helping mm -hmm. Bayard to do right. all, all these things. Yes, right. absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the current uh, Washington, D.C. delegate, Eleanor, Eleanor Holmes, Holmes, were his assistants on the march. Yeah. Right. Uh, yeah. And actually, the march was all over. Bayard Ruskin went down to the mall and was picking up paper and <laughs> yeah. helping to make sure it was really nice. Yeah. And to show A. Philip Randolph, it was quite an event. Well, yeah, you know, it's interesting because uh, Kennedy invited them to the White House after the march it was so Correct. successful. And Bayard said, well, no, I, I don't need to go. But the very men, Roy Wilkins, and some of the other leaders that had opposed him, mm -hmm. said, you go. And it was like, finally, none of that other mattered because they knew it was Anyway, he did. Mm -hmm. he, they knew it was he did. And let's just talk a second about what he did do. One, he brought the whole concept of Gandhian nonviolence to Dr. King. Right. We believe King got it from Gandhi. King never went to India. Bayard, in 1948, right. went to India, right. and it was right after Gandhi was assassinated, but his closest associates taught Bayard the whole concept of right. nonviolence. So number one, that's what he did. After the march is over, Bayard tells uh, Dr. King, look it, you've got something going here. You need a foundation by which to move forward. So King said, go back to New York and draft it for me. He went back to New York and he drafted uh, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference as an organization. Went to Atlanta and they, you have a room full of ministers, they all accept it. And King, of course, is the head and the rest of the folks, Andrew Young, all have positions. Then King says to the ministers, well, I think the executive director should be Bayer because he did this. Oh, man. They went crazy. Yes. And said, no way, no way. And so Bayard backed out. So then we had the whole incident with, um, I can never think of the guys, you can help me out here, uh, the congressman from New York. Adam Clayton Powell. Adam Clayton Powell. In 1960, <laughs> King and, and uh, A. Philip Randolph, they planned a march on the 1960 Democratic Convention in LA. All right. John Kennedy found out about it, went to Powell and said, hey, Put an end to that. I don't want any problems with my convention. Sure. So Powell knew that his position was online. So what he did was he called King in Brazil and said, look, it, mm -hmm. if you don't mark, back off on that march, I'm going to tell the world that you're having an affair with Bayard Russell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bayard Russell. King called Bayard and told him what had happened. Bayard said, well, What's really the difference if, not that they had an affair, he said, well, they've already said you're a womanizer. Is that so okay, much yeah. worse yeah. than the other? King said yes. Yeah. yeah. King said yes, yeah. it is. And so that ended their friendship for a while. A king had to remove him as like the liaison for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference in New York. And that's when Bayard goes to India and goes to England and comes back. And A. Philip Randolph says, look, we have to have a match. And he says, you and King have to patch your differences because yeah. I need you and I need King. Right. And they did. Yep. And uh, King, I believe, I, uh, I'm speculating, but I would venture to say King regret what he did. And they became very close after that. Right. And if, if there was any breakup between the two, it was on King's famous speech in New York at Riverside Church, where he spoke out against Johnson's war yeah. in Vietnam. So those are some of the things that this man has done. Well, Fred, don't you think that uh, Bayard Ruskin also moved uh, King into the more economic and jobs? Uh, and maybe one of the reasons that he got into the poverty and unemployment issues, because Ruskin got off on that too. You know, there's, there's a scene in this book where they're driving through Mississippi, and they're, they're with this gentleman who was a leader of the NACP down there, and they stop at this sharecropper's house, and they go inside, and, and, and Bear can see right through the house. There's no radio, no television. They have three kids sleeping on the floor. And so they, they asked this man, 
What do you think about what's happening in Montgomery? He says, what do you mean, what's happening in Montgomery? I don't know. He says, you guys come down here, you do this civil rights stuff, then you leave, and we're stuck here the way we are. And that's what Baird began to realize that what is probably the most important thing is economics right. over the social. And that's when he fell out with King because when King did the Riverside speech, Bayard said, look it, we need Johnson for the next move, which is economic. You just lost him <laughs> when you did that. And, and I think a lot of the other leaders felt the same way. And it's about time now we need to All right, so where do they come get back this book? around. They get this book on Good Amazon. Point. They can go to Amazon and order the book. Uh, that's probably the best way right now to get it. Okay. However, if you want an autographed copy from <laughs> all three of us, you can go to jjedpublications.com and you can order, we'll have PayPal, or if you want to contact me directly, you can do it at fredwilliams at satx.rr.com. That's one, if you want to do PayPal, go to jjaedpublications.com. If you want to do it through me, it's Fred Williams at satx.rr.com. I'll have a pile of these books signed by these two gentlemen and me, <laughs> and we'll send you an autographed copy. And Fred, by all means, um, buy this book, tell people about this book. What's the title? Baird and Martin. And I think it's... A historical it's novel about our, the civil our, rights, about Fred, the friendship and the civil rights yeah, movement. But I want to make one final point, and I think you two gentlemen will agree with me. After the March on Martian and the struggle and the fight and the efforts of Bayard and Martin, 10 months later, the Congress passes the Civil Rights Act. Right. Then the next year, the Voting Rights Act. Yes. That is a result of these two individuals right, right. and the Civil Rights Movement. Absolutely. That is still the history today. Right. Absolutely. Well, thank you. I want to thank you, gentlemen, yes, for absolutely. being my guest here today. Thank you for everything you've done on this friend. book. And good luck. Thank you. Yeah. Good luck. <laughs> and please, we're asking you to go to the Amazon order the book, or I gave you two websites you could go to to get signed copies. This is an important book. This, this book is more important than, uh, I hope these men behind me agree with me, than the financial consideration. This is a story that needs to be told, a man's life that needs to be exposed to the world. And we're hoping that you'll agree with us and go out and purchase Bayard and Martin a historical novel about friendship and the civil rights movement. This is Fred Williams, discussion with the writer Fred, telling our story our way. <laughs>